400 years ago were published some of the greatest poems we've ever known in the English language. 2009 is the 400th anniversary of the publication of Shakespeare's sonnets, which burst onto an astonished London scene in 1609. Why would you say the sonnets have become so popular as part of Shakespeare's output? Jonathan. Well, have become is the really interesting part of your question there, Paul, because uh, actually when they were published uh, 400 years ago in 1609, um, we don't know that they were particularly successful. Shakespeare's most successful plays were quickly reprinted, showing that there was a demand for them. The vogue for writing sonnets had slightly faded away by 1609, and the sonnets were not reprinted in Shakespeare's lifetime. They weren't included in the great first folio of his collected works. It was only later, really a lot later, perhaps particularly in the 19th and 20th centuries, that the sonnets came to the centre of people's thinking about Shakespeare. And I guess the reason for that is because they are great love poems, and they seem to be great autobiographical poems. They seem somehow as... William Wordsworth said, to be the key that unlocks Shakespeare's heart. Now, in our discussion, we may well start teasing away at that idea. I'd, I'd like but, to do that, yeah. But uh, the obvious answer to the question, why the sonnets are still celebrated, still read today, is that there is no other collection of love poetry that covers the full spectrum of the experience of love mm -hmm. with such intensity and with, with such memorable phrases. I mean, there are so many books that have uh, taken their, their titles from Shakespeare's sonnets. The English translation of, of uh, Marcel Proust's great novel, Remembrance of Things Past, that's from the sonnets, or The Darling Buds of May. Um, huge uh, numbers of phrases that have just... Uh, people have, have, have grabbed them mm -hmm. as being... Uh, somehow crystallising something about a particular moment in the experience of love. It sounds like the sonnets have filtered into our subconsciousness and our, our way of thinking about love. Stanley, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about why, though, that's taken so long to come about, um, the availability of the sonnets. Yeah, it took a long time, partly because, as Jonathan says, uh, they were not, I think, a success on their first publication uh, in 1609. On the first publication, though, of course, one or two of them had appeared in print beforehand, uh, two of them in, in a volume called The Passionate Pilgrim. And we do know that some sonnets, had, by Shakespeare at least, had been written by 1598 when the, uh, the anthologist uh, Francis Mears referred to them. And there, of course, it's also perhaps worth remembering there are quite a lot of manuscripts of Shakespeare's sonnets, not in his own hand, alas. Uh, but there are at least 40 manuscript versions of Shakespeare's sonnets between uh, 1600 and 1640, which was fairly later, I think, which is quite interesting because they did get transcribed into people's notebooks, their commonplace books, as they were called. But they, uh, that the volume, the 1609 volume, as Jonathan says, was not reprinted. Uh, it, the, poem, the sonnets were reprinted in a garbled form in 1640, by a publisher called John Benson, a publisher, a uh, rather fraudulent volume, which, which included poems that were not by Shakespeare, and also which garbled the sonnets, interestingly, partly by giving some of them the appearance of being addressed to a male, uh, to a female, mm -hmm. even though, in fact, they were, some of them, uh, addressed to, to, to a male person. Yeah, that Benson changed some of the pronouns. He changed, yes, only three of them. He, he delighted did, sonnets together but to make Yes, he made longer poems. He also gave some of them titles, yeah. uh, like to his mistress and so on. Mm. Actually, I think if I remember rightly, he calls the sonnet, which refers to the addressee's prick, a poem addressed to his mistress, which is a little bit surprising. Flying uh, in the face of strong evidence. Indeed, yeah. yes. Coming back to Francis yeah. Mears, um, Francis Mears yeah. he uses that word sugared, sugared to sonnets, describe the yeah. sonnets, doesn't he? Shakespeare's sugared mm. sonnets among his private friends. And, you know, from sugared and private, these poems do move towards a really compelling sexuality, which Benson mm. recognises in 16 years. Yeah. I mean, sugared, uh, sweet, mellifluous, the, these were words that uh, everybody really used to describe mm. Shakespeare's poetic language in some of his more sort of romantic plays, as well as in the sonnets. And 
Um, there are very interesting links between some of the sonnets and some of the relatively early plays. Um, Love's Labour's Lost, for instance, uh, written probably about 1595, is a play that's full of sonnets and it's about people writing love sonnets. And competing. Yes, yeah. and, and Romeo and Juliet, of course, when Romeo and Juliet first meet, their words weave together in the form of a sonnet. So that sense of the, the sweet love poetry of Shakespeare, it was, it was there and well known in his plays. It was also there, there and well known in his very successful narrative love poet, Venus and Adonis. But the extra dimension, as you say, for the sonnets is this idea of them being circulated among his private friends. Yeah. Does that mean circulated among them, or does it even mean to, addressed to, addressed his to? most intimate yes. friends? You, yes. His sonnets among his private friends. Sugar sonnets, by the way, is a phrase that's already been used by Richard Barnfield a few years before. I suspect it was just a sort of cliche. I don't think we should regard Francis Mears as being in any sense a real no. critic of Shakespeare. No. He's very commonplace in the things that he writes. Mm -hmm in that curious work of Still, it's, it's, it's the earliest reference we have to yes, the sonnets. To it's all, having written sonnets. Uh, written sonnets, and also um, it shows us that the sonnets in circulation in manuscript form and, and reminds us that Shakespeare was writing these poems over many years before their publication. Yes, indeed. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the kind of the interesting but also problematic thing of, things about a, a lot of the, the love poetry of the period, that, um, that very often that kind of poetry wasn't written so much for the public audience, for the, the bookstores of St Paul's, but it was circulated to um, a sort of elite, a kind of coterie audience. I mean, if you think of the other great love poet of, of, of the period, the only poet, I think, in the English language who sort of is Shakespeare's equal in the intensity of his love poetry, that would, of course, be John Donne. But John Donne's great love poems um, were nearly all circulated in manuscript and only published quite a while after his death. Yes, that's true. But of course, it's also fair to say, isn't it, that the sonnet sequences, and I don't regard Shakespeare as a sonnet sequences, but the sonnet sequences of 1591 onwards till about 1596, beginning with Sir Philip Sidney's Astrid and Stella, are much more through composed, mm -hmm. much more, one feels, volumes that were intended eventually at least in publication, even though in Sydney's case there was a private element to them too. I think uh, this is one of the things that make me feel very strongly that Shakespeare's is a collection of poems written probably at different times mm. yeah. uh, rather than a sonnet sequence in the sense that many of the earlier ones clearly were. Yeah. And it's in that sense they're much more like Dunn's, John yes, Dunn's poems. Because the, the, the thing that is so strikingly different from the other sonnet sequence published at the time is the fact that the, the person addressed never has a name. Mm -hmm. as, you, as you say, the, the, the genre, I mean obviously the genre goes back in the Italian Renaissance to Petrarch's sonnets to Laura. Mm -hmm. But in England, the, the sort of the key volume, the most famous volume, is Sir Philip Sidney's Astrophil mm -hmm. to Stella. The poet calls himself Astrophil, calls his beloved mistress Stella. And then just about every poet starts writing a sequence. Samuel Daniel writes it to Delia and mm -hmm. someone else to Lycia so and Cecilia and Diana. And <laughs> Diana and so it goes on, uh, Celia and Delia. But, uh, but of course, the, the infuriating, fascinating thing about Shakespeare's sonnets is so many of them say, you know, I am making you immortal. I'm immortalising you, but he never gives the name or even a sort of mythological name for the you in question. So we feel like we're agreeing very much that Shakespeare's sonnets represent diverse sonnets for various occasions, a sort of rattle bag rather than anything which you could call a sequence. I, I certainly believe that, yes. I think that's right. And what might follow from that, which I think is very interesting, is that we may need to think of them being addressed to a number of different people. Yes. Um, the, there's a long history of people trying to identify the lovely boy mm -hmm. and the dark lady who seem to be the two addressees mm -hmm. of the sonnets. But recent work on the, the language of the poems, comparing them to the language of Shakespeare's mm -hmm. plays, has suggested that some of the sonnets have a language characteristic of relatively early Shakespeare, the mid-1590s, the period of Love's Labour's Lost, Romeo and Juliet, Venus and Adonis, mm -hmm. his, his narrative poem. Others of them have very, very strong linguistic connections to later plays, plays of the period um, early in King James's reign, after 1603. Um, and indeed, the, the, of all the poems, the one that 
seems most likely to be sort of datable in terms of referring to a particular event. Uh, it's 106, is it, or 108, about the, the eclipse of the moon, which certainly seems to suggest something about the death of Queen Elizabeth at the time of King James. And yet, as Stanley has said, we know some of the poems belong to this earlier period. Well, the, the so. one you just referred to, after all, has been a bone of contention. The, the oh, right. phrase... 107. 107. Yeah. The key yeah. phrase. What is the key phrase? Our mortal just moon remind, is... Just remind us. Um, shall I read it? Yeah. Uh, not mine own fears, nor the prophetic soul of the wide world dreaming on things to come, can yet the lease of my true love control, supposed as forfeit to a confined doom. The mortal moon hath her eclipse endured, and the sad augurs mock their own presage. Incertainties now crown themselves assured, and peace proclaims olives of endless age. Now with the drops of this most balmy time, my love looks fresh, and death to me subscribes. Since, spite of him, I'll live in this poor rhyme, while he insults o'er dull and speechless tribes. And thou in this shalt find thy monument, when tyrants' crests and tombs of brass are spent. And it's the sad augurs mock their own presage, uncertainties now crown themselves assured, mm -hmm. and peace proclaims all those of endless mm -hmm. age, which we can helps us to call this the dating sonnet. Yeah, mm -hmm. but the paradox is that at least three different dates mm -hmm. have been suggested. Least, One, yeah. the, the, the mortal moon eclipse has been linked, for example, to the Armada. It's been linked to the grand climacteric when Queen Elizabeth was 67 years old. And also, mm -hmm. more plausibly, I think, and I suspect mm -hmm. that Jonathan agrees, it's been linked with the, the death of Elizabeth mm -hmm. and the coming to the throne of James I, who was particularly mm -hmm. proud of his peacemaking activities. Yeah, so especially I, as, of course, Shakespeare and his acting company, they, they were actually there when the peace treaty that uh, was signed at Somerset yes, House yes, uh, yes. took place. Because, of course, all through Queen Elizabeth's reign, you know, Shakespeare's a war poet, but King James brings brings peace. But, um, but it, as I say, I'm interested in these, these recent sort of stylistic analyses, comparing the vocabulary, because the, the idea that maybe some of these are Elizabethan sonnets and some are Jacobean sonnets, mm. I, I find very, very intriguing. It is intriguing. It also means that what we've got here are 154 poems written probably over more than 20 years. And if we, if we, if we accept what Andrew Gurr was arguing in 1972, about Sonnet 145 being maybe Shakespeare's earliest poem, to Anne Hathaway, the Hathaway yes. then that really just widens mm. open what, what these represent in Shakespeare's creative output. Yes. They're, they're kind of like, not, not footnotes, that, that diminishes them, but they're, they're documents which can be set alongside his, his ongoing canon of work. And, and which can be connected to it to help date them. Yeah, the, the one you just referred to, fascinatingly, actually puns on the name of Hathaway. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very, very strong argument for that, being, for that mm -hmm. being Shakespeare's earliest surviving poem. Uh, one written possibly during his courtship when he was only, uh, only 18. It sticks out like a sore thumb because it's the only yes, one yeah. in the collection in tetramic. Yes, it's four, four stress line, four, four 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 not a five yeah. stress line. Um, it, and it's a it's not actually a very good poem, it's, no, which uh, it's really, might also be evidence. It doesn't represent him at his finest, certainly. So, um, a collection rather than a sequence, sugared from the time period and connecting up with, with John Donne as being personal poems to addressees in Shakespeare's case, whose identities are lost to time. And then from sugared, though, we have this, this, these private friends. And I, I really am interested at the point at which critics become anxious about the sexuality of these poems because they do oh, indeed, they and the, these do. poems go underground for almost two centuries yeah they go underground partly simply for publication reasons mm -hmm. because they were not I included in the folio none of shakespeare's non that's entirely a collection of plays uh, and partly because I think they're, they're rather difficult poems. I think we should acknowledge that. Some of them are very difficult poems, like some of Dunn's poems. Uh, and also, I think the sonnets were out of fashion by the time they were published. It is surprising, that, because Shakespeare himself was at the height of his... Well, it was slightly towards the end of his career when, when, when they were published. Uh, but yes, I think sexuality has got a lot to do with, especially the late 
the late uh, 18th century attitude towards the poems, there are ridiculous uh, rejections of some of them on the grounds that uh, how can we want our Shakespeare, how can we believe our Shakespeare addressed love poems to a male person? I mean, George Stevens, the 18th century scholar, had the ridiculous notion that the sonnets uh, were all addressed to Queen Elizabeth, even the one that refers to the, to the beloved's prick. Uh, his, his knowledge of female anatomy seems to be a little askew. Uh, I mean, what's curious is you get with the advent of a really first good edition of the sonnets since 1609, yeah. with Malone's edition of 1780, yeah. you get that watershed of the critical anxiety yes, also yeah. I mean, with the Romantic poets and um, how they're reading the sonnets and they become personal autobiographical accounts at the same time as they have this anxiety of, of, of sexuality surrounding them. Is that... Yeah, no, I think I think that's right. I mean, they, for say for John Keats, they were they were tremendously important um, through the eighteenth century and really down to the time of Wordsworth. The sonnets that were sort of most admired and imitated in England were those of John Milton, mm. which were very public poems, um, often on political subjects, uh, written in a different form with a different structure from Shakespeare's sonnets. The uh, Milton sonnet divides with an eight and a six. Remember, a sonnet always has 14 lines, um, whereas the Shakespearean pattern is the four, 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 two formation, three quatrains with their rhymes and then a rhyming couplet at the end. Um, and it was really only with um, Keats and his contemporaries that the Shakespearean form was revived and imitated. Mm. And for Keats, you know, a great passionate love poet, they, they were um, incredibly intense personal love poems. And it was a friend of Keats, actually, um, a man called Charles Brown, uh, who wrote in, I think it was 1838, a book um, called Shakespeare's Autobiographical Poems, which I think was the first sustained attempt to map the story of the sonnets onto Shakespeare's life. But you see, even a great poet like Coleridge rejected the idea yeah. that Shakespeare could possibly address such yeah. poems uh, to a man and was very, very, uh, very, very adamant about that. Uh, I think it's fair to say, isn't it, that this is an enormously varied collection of poems. They, they range from very lyrical, beautiful poems, the ones that are best known, I suppose, like number 18. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? They love poems. Some of them are love poems which any young man is likely to want to read to his beloved. Uh, but others are very knotty, difficult, uh, metaphysical poems. Uh, and I think the variety of the poems is something that needs to be stressed. Most people read them, I suppose, not as a whole, but in anthologies, in collections. They hear sonnets like... Uh, uh, um, 116, Let Me Not exactly, the Marriage that's of Trimines, think, yeah. Yeah. which is a philosophical poem, in a way. Yes, and also, you see, that is a, is a poem which is often read at weddings, mm -hmm. for example, Let Me Not to the Marriage of True Minds and Meta Pediments. Echoes the language of the prayer book any lawful impediment. Yes, it does. But also, it's among the sonnets which a lot of people believe to be addressed to a male person, mm. which is typical of the ambiv ambivalence of a lot of the poems. Mm. Uh, and this is one of the th areas in which I think it's damaging to make this supposition that the first 126 poems are all uh, addressed to or concern a male rather than... Uh, but, but there is... I'm, I'm interested in this because the, the, one of the sort of recurring motifs in the sonnet is a sort of battle between a, a very intense spiritual bond and a physical sexual bond. Yes. Is, is it 144 where he talks about his bad angel and his good angel? Yes. You know, the youth right there. Two loves I have. Two loves I have of comfort and despair. Um, and it, it, it seems to be one way of uh, possibly reading the sonnets is to sort of step back from the idea of seeking an autobiographical narrative in them and think about them as a kind of drama in which the, the figure of the youth and the, the sort of the, the, the extraordinarily intense spiritual bond between Shakespeare and the fair youth symbolises the kind of um, spiritual aspects of love, the marriage of true minds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas the sonnet's specifically about being in my mistress's bed and often then being very disgusted by sex, um, symbolise the physical aspect of love. And it could actually be that we need to think of the addressees of the sonnets as almost like dramatic characters 
um, one representing love in its sexual aspect, the other in its spiritual. What do you think of that, Stanley? I, I don't think one could talk about the characters because I think there's a, a multiplicity of characters here. Uh, I think there is, as you suggest, there's a great tension in the poet sometimes between spiritual love and physical desire, which he's conscious of and which throws himself at times into a sense of sin. And these mm. are the poems of a man with a conscience. Some of them are clearly the poems, whether we believe it to be Shakespeare himself or just a fictional character that he's adopting, they're clearly the poems of somebody who is a bit disgusted with his sexuality, even at the same time as he accepts it. 151. One of the most extraordinary uh, of the sonnets, uh, which is one of the most uh, physically explicit poems in the language, I suppose. Love is too young to know what conscience is. Yet who knows not? Conscience is born of love. Then, gentle cheater, urge not my amiss, lest guilty of my faults thy sweet self prove. For thou betraying me, I do betray my nobler part, to my gross body's treason. My soul doth tell my body that he may triumph in love. Flesh stays no farther reason, but rising at thy name, doth point out thee as his triumphant prize. Proud of this pride, he is contented thy poor drudge to be, to stand in thy affairs, fall by thy side. No want of conscience hold it that I call her love, for whose dear love I rise and fall. The I in that last I could be the penis of the poet, rising and falling. It is an extraordinarily explicit poem. But you see, again, it has this dichotomy of the soul and the body. Yeah. My soul does tell my body that he may triumph in love. There's a, there's a tension here. Yeah. which is troubling to the poet. Yeah. But that, you see, I think is why people in many ways have sort of misclassified the sonnets by linking them to those rather pretty sonnet sequences yeah. of, oh, of, of the, 15, the, the, the 1590s, yeah. um, which, of course, he parodies in, you know, My, My Mistress' Eyes Are Nothing Like the Sun, 130. 130, is a parody of that sort of sonnet. Once you start talking about, you know, the debate between the soul and the body, these kinds of puns on the conscience and mm. the will of the body and all the pun there on pride and I and so on. Um, again, that's taking me straight back to the metaphysical poets, mm. to John, yep. John Donne. I think that's where, that's the tradition we need to read but, them and A metaphysical idea, if you didn't bring mm. sexuality to that poem, you could hear the doctrine of the resurrection of the body, the flesh that rises at the name mm -hmm. and, 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 and paces forth. He uses the phrase pace forth in, in Sonnet 55 as well. Um, of course, Shakespeare names himself yeah, in some of these sonnets. Yeah. The so only name that occurs, yeah. really, in the sonnets. 134, so 135, 136 and 143. The name will. Will, will, don't they? And this is one of the things that make it difficult not to suspect a good deal, it seems to me, of autobiographical residence in these poems. The, the word will occurs 13 times, I think, in Sonnet 100 and, is it 134. 134. And it clearly part for my name is will, he says. 135. Yeah. 135, for my name is will, and that mm. is Shakespeare's name. But it also suggests that the, uh, um, a man who is involved with, the, with both the woman and with the persona of the poet also has the name will. Mm. Can, so, can, we, can we challenge some of these um, critical phrases that are so convenient to use around the sonnets, like the woman, the young man, the yes, youth? The dark I, I really take issue with that sense of assuming that these are fixed mm. identities which can be charted over a number of poems, because mm. I don't think they can be. Yeah. I think if we're, we, we really stare at these poems and ask ourselves, you know, can we say that this is addressed to an imaginary male or female, is actually the imagined addressee of the sonnet not revealed, which it, it, it isn't for most of them. You know, what are we left with? A, 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 just a handful of poems where the gender is, is, is utterly is clear. And, and, and among those, um, you know, differently described, she's never described as the dark lady, for mm. example. Um, he, he's only a young man and a, and a boy, which is, is, is different to a young man, mm. on, on a couple of occasions in these poems. And, 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 I, and I find that really, really fascinating that somehow, and I think it's rooted back to the Romantic period with, that, with, the, with the first great edition of, of Malone, because spelling out these relationships and creating a story with these poems, somehow those have, have laid down 
critical commonplaces which yeah. just oh, yeah. Yeah. remain in the ether around these poems yeah. and are convenient um, but only helpful to a degree and I think I think somehow imprison these poems yeah. in, in in a way which we think about them in Shakespeare's imagination and his, his, his wider output. Yeah, I do agree with that, but I, I think we don't want to go to the opposite extreme and sort of fragment them down and suggest that, you know, every single poem is autonomous and that there aren't connections, because there are sequences where there would be maybe two sonnets in succession yeah, yeah, that are minis, and little, and little so groups. I mean, I'm particularly yeah. interested in the group from sort of 78 to, to 86, so where he's clearly poems. talking about... Uh, the idea of other poets mm. seeking the, whether it's the favour, the patronage, the love is not quite clear, but, but, but there's, there's a definite sense there that like sort of bees around a honeypot, there are a number of poets who are interested in some particular figure, mm. a, a, a patron, a potential um, a potential lover, it's, you know, he's wonderfully ambiguous about that, but uh, that seems to be a, a, a group. He does seem to introduce a character or characters of the rival poet or poets there. Yeah. Mention of, um, of patrons surely raises the question of the dedication to these poems. A curious dedication, a very curious document. Uh, which is not signed by Shakespeare. It bears the initials at the end of it, T, T, Thomas Thorpe. Now, when Shakespeare was writing his great poems, Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucrece, he did dedicate his poems to a specific person, a person whose portrait is on the wall of the room in which we're speaking now, the Earl of Southampton. Henry Risley. Henry Risley, the third Earl of Southampton. Uh, and Shakespeare clearly had a, a close relationship to Henry Risley uh, during 1593 and 1594 at least, which is the time when we have good reason to believe at least quite a lot of the sonnets were written, because as you were saying, this is the time when they occur in plays that, that we're more able closely to date to that period, like Love's Labour's Lost. It doesn't mean, does it, though, that all of the poems which might be addressed to a man necessarily are written to a patron or Henry oh, no, Risley, not and, at all, uh, no. or, or the same, or the same no. man. No, indeed, I think it's important that the dedication doesn't even say that the poems were written to mm. this W H. W H is the only begetter of these mm. ensuing poems. Uh, now, what does yeah. begetter mean? It yeah. might mean simply the only person who who procured the manuscript. It might mean, of course, the inspirer. But again, it's one of the great mysteries around the sonnets. And of course, it might mean the author, because it has been suggested I, I, suggested in Victorian oh, times, yes. and since quite plausibly, that it's actually a misprint. Um, and it should be WS or WS. But you think that's more plausible than I do? So William Shakespeare okay. dedicated to the, by the printer by, to, by to the, the poet. By the publisher, because the, the notion of a, a writer as the begetter of their work. An ever-living yeah. poet is mentioned in the dedication as well, isn't it? And of course, it's Victorian times that sees the... A uh, whole kind of um, literary investigation, the, the, the mock investigation by Oscar Wilde, yes, who himself yeah, yes. proposed an identity for Mr. W. H. Yes, as yes. Willie Hughes, a boy actor in Shakespeare's yeah, company, yeah. which in a kind of detective fiction short story mm. genre. Yeah, okay. well, we have, sorry. sorry. I was just going to say, I mean, ever, ever since Oscar, well, before Oscar Wilde, I mean, back to, back to the early 19th century, the idea that the, the, the addressee was synonymous with Master W.H. and might be identified with either Henry Risley, the Earl of Southampton, or William, William that, that name, Will Herbert, the Earl of Pembroke. I mean, those theories have been around for a long time. And new theories keep, you know, keep, keep coming out. I, I noticed just the other week a new book was publi uh, published suggesting that uh, W.H. and the addressee actually is, is Prince Henry, the son of yes. King James. Yes, and, I saw uh, that. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, Grail Marcus, the great Bob Dylan scholar, he has a new book coming out with some other candidate. I mean, it just, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's endless. Gentlemen, we find ourselves in an exhibition called Shakespeare Found, A Life Portrait, and it, it, it's in, in some ways an ideal context to be talking about the sonnets. We, we've hit upon the identity of Mr. W.H. On the wall opposite me is a portrait of Mr. W.H., potentially, Henry Risley, the other Southampton. And I think what, what this does is it allows us to think of the sonnets at least two of them this exhibition allows us to individually as biographical poems and you know when you look at the portrait of Henry Risley Earl of Southampton and read sonnet 20 at the same time which begins a woman's face with nature's own hand painted hast thou the master mistress of my passion somehow the poem and the poet and the painting 
become imaginatively engaged because he does look incredibly feminine in the picture. And it was only in 2002 that it was proposed properly, thoroughly, that it was a portrait of A, a man, and B, the Earl of Southampton. Mm -hmm. Um, so yes, it believed to be a woman long and, before but that. That's an example of how, with, you know, looking at the sonnets as individual yeah. poems, yeah. you, you yeah. can read them differently biographically. Yeah, exactly. And another painting in the exhibition is of Southampton's mother, um, the, the, uh, at the age, age of 13. And sonnet three has the line, Thou art thy mother's glass, and she in thee calls back the lovely April of her prime. And when you put the portrait of his mother alongside the portrait of her son, you can see as they're reflected in the mirror a glass, one portrait, the Earl, calling back the lovely April of the Prime, age 13, of, of, of the mother um, as you compare the pictures. So it's, it's a really rich example of how imaginative connections can be made in all sorts of ways with these poems. It, it's part of their power, it's part of their enduring appeal. Um, in the in the in the another part of the exhibition, there's a uh, an artistic installation by George Chakravarti, um, commissioned by the Royal Shakespeare Company and the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, as a response to the exhibition. And and what George's installation does is it, it plays fast and loose with this whole idea of fixed identity, um, poet, patron. It was as a response to the exhibition as well as to the 400th anniversary of these remarkable poems. Have you got a favourite sonnet, Jonathan? Yeah, I have Paul, actually. Um, and it's, it's not one that is immediately, obviously, a passionate love poem, a sort of, you know, I am in love and on cloud nine. It's actually a poem um, about the sorts of, the kind of intense difficulties of communication in love and the way that trust doesn't always work. Well, it's, it's hard to explain, it's easier to read. It's, it's on 138. When my love swears that she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies, that she might think me some untutored youth, unlearned in the world's false subtleties. Thus vainly thinking that she thinks me young, although she knows my days are past the best, simply I credit her false speaking tongue. On both sides thus is simple truth suppressed. But wherefore says she not she is unjust? And wherefore say not I that I am old? O oh, love's best habit is in seeming trust, and age in love loves not to have years told. Therefore I lie with her and she with me, and in our faults by lies we flattered be. I mean, the, the reason I, I think this is such a great poem is partly because the, the argument a sonnet is so often an argument. The argument works so beautifully in relation to the structure. It's got the three quatrains of four lines, each setting up an arg part of the argument, then taking it forward, and then the, the rounding off in the couplet. And at the same time, there's fantastic wordplay in it. I mean, obviously, the key wordplay here is lie, in the sense of not tell the truth, but also lie, in the sense mm. of lie with, and hence make love too. Um, but what, what I love most about it is the, it, it's extraordinary realism about what, what human beings are like and how, uh, as we grow in our, in our relationships and in our understanding of love, we have to go beyond the simple joys of, shall I compare thee to a son's day, thou art more lovely. We, ha we have to accept um, that maybe there are necessary untruths or things not spoken, simple truth is not what it's all about. Love is much more complicated than that. And there are self-deceptions too. That's mm, what's so exactly. wonderful about the couplet yeah. there, I right? think, yes. that he's acknowledging yeah. that they're kidding themselves even yeah. while they are yeah. making love. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of the playfulness of context and biography, it's about a woman rather than addressed to a woman. Um, there's nothing dark or black about the woman. And if you relate it yes. to Shakespeare's other work, yeah. it could be Antony talking about Cleopatra. As a, as a kind of playful suggestion of, of thinking about these poems in different contexts. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that, you know, Shakespeare is above all, you know, began as an actor, he became a dramatist. He's always thinking of situations mm. in dramatic mm. terms. Mm. Yeah, there's like one end of a telephone conversation in a way, aren't there? There's also yeah. soliloquies that 
Uh, but that is one of the things that make it very tempting to see them autobiographically, I think. There are things in these poems that would mean nothing to your ordinary purchaser of a volume of poetry. I mean, a, a, a poem like Shall I Compare Thee is a lyric poem which anybody might enjoy uh, and, and could be included in an anthology of Elizabethan poetry in Shakespeare's time or in ours. But some of these others do seem to me to be intensely personal poems which are meaningless unless you have the other side of the picture. Now, admittedly, this does relate to the possibility that they're sort of sketches for speeches in plays, that they are uh, Angelo in Measure for Measure, for example, would have, uh, could have speak some of these sonnets, it seems to me, or Troilus yes. in Troilus and Cressida. But at the same time, it's one of the reasons why I think Shakespeare didn't particularly want them to be published. You see, I don't think he did. Mm. I think these, were, these are published as Shakespeare's sonnets, not my sonnets by mm. William Shakespeare, but Shakespeare's sonnets published by T.T., e. T., the publisher, mm. Thomas Thorpe. And it's as if he's uh, newly, uh, never before imprinted, he's sort of mm. saying, here they are at last. Yeah. You know, it's like a scandal mag almost. Here you it are, is, now you yeah. can read these yeah. poems which we've all heard about, but actually, you know, mm. they, they, we, we knew, knew there's a bit scandalous. Yeah, I mean, there's a scholarly the, debate we should say about whether the publication was authorised or yeah. unauthorised. I'm convinced they're unauthorised. Yes, yeah, me too, me too, you know. 400 years on, how do you see responses to the sonnets shaping up? in the next few years? How, how would you encourage people to read these poems? How would they appreciate their poetry or their, their ways of reading criticism of them? I should encourage the, them to read the poems as a miscellaneous collection of poems, not as a sonnet sequence. It is true that there are many sequences. It's true that the first group of poems have the common theme of encouraging someone to marry. Uh, and not too much to marry, actually, is to beget an heir. It's interesting, it's not just to beget a baby, but to beget somebody, an heir. Uh, but at the same time, it does seem to me we need to dismiss the old critical cliches, the old commonplace ideas about the young man. It's astonishing how many responsible critics still use that phrase as if they're all about one young man. And similarly with a dark lady, whereas I think it's only about seven of the last group of poems actually refer to the woman as being dark. So I think that one of the things we need to do, that criticism I hope will do in the future, is to free itself of some of the cliches which derive partly from generic considerations, from the idea that these are a sonnet sequence, mm -hmm. like the earlier sonnet sequences by Daniel or Spencer and so on. They're not, I think. They're Shakespeare's sonnets, not the sonnets addressed to anybody or in, anybody. Jonathan, how would you like to send them to the present into the future? I'd like people to read them slowly. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah. As Stanley suggests, to read them individually, uh, perhaps to have them by their bed and to learn them uh, by heart. It's the best way of getting them. It's how you know, actors know Shakespeare because they learn his lines, I think. Mm -hmm. Learning a few of the sonnets would not do anybody any harm. And um, as I've sort of suggested and hinted at various points in our discussion, I think we need to sort of remap them. And again, this is similar to what Stanley is saying, and put them in the context not of the Elizabethan sonnet sequence, but of the works of the metaphysical poets of John Donne, later of Andrew Marvel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stanley. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs>